Hi, online psychology students. This is Mrs. Hansen, and I'm checking in with you because I can't believe that we're entering week eight on Monday. This Sunday, May 1st, is your deadline on Chapter 14, which I know is really, really challenging, um, but it's such a crucial part of the semester. It's learning about all the psychological disorders, of which there are many. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has over 250 disorders uh, individually in 20 categories. And you're only learning the tip of the iceberg in about seven categories and maybe three to four or five disorders in each category. So as challenging as Chapter 14 is, I just want you to know that it's just uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if you continue and major in psychology, you'll be uh, learning about a lot more of the psychological disorders. I'd like you to know that here at COS, we offer a wonderful class uh, after you finish this introductory class. You can take abnormal psychology, which is a, an entire semester studying all the psychological disorders, many more than you uh, are exposed to in this introductory class. It's called Abnormal Psychology and the number is Psych 34. So if you're registering for next semester and you want an interesting psychology class, I don't think it's offered online, but um, we have fantastic instructors here on campus who teach abnormal psychology. Um, Don Nickel and Linda Del Rio are just fabulous and I think you'd really enjoy the class. Um, I'm sorry we had so little time to devote to this interesting uh, chapter. I hope that you refrained from diagnosing yourself as you read about all these disorders because you're not qualified to <laughs> diagnose yourself and uh, also your family. You're not di <laughs> you're tempted to diagnose your family, I'm sure, but you're not qualified to do that. Now, as we enter into Chapter 15, starting Monday, it's a natural segue to go from the psychological disorders to therapies. There are, you know, myriad of therapies that are available, and sometimes therapists specialize in a particular form of therapy. But most therapists today who are licensed, and it's very, very important that you if you're going to go to a therapist, you go to a licensed therapist. Oh, I have a Diet Coke problem, addiction. It's very important that you go to a licensed therapist, like a licensed clinical social worker or a, um, a licensed psychologist or an MSW or a MFCC. Anyway, it's very important that they're just not... Um, fly by night, that they're really trained. These therapies can be extremely effective, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it takes, okay, because a lot of people have a misconception about therapy. They think, well, if I walk into the therapist's office and sit in that office, something magical will happen, I'll be cured. No, it takes a lot of work. It takes commitment on the part of the client. And most therapists today use an eclectic approach. I think your chapter 15 talks about that. Eclectic, E-C-L-E-C-T-I-C, -E -E eclectic. I think I spelled it correctly. Anyway, um, eclectic means a combination, you know, a mixture. If, you, if I decorate my house in an eclectic style, then I might have antiques, and then I might have modern, and I might have... Um, you know, different styles all mixed together. And that's what we mean by eclectic approach to therapy, that therapists are combining these approaches. They're not necessarily just treating you with one. But it really is up to the therapist. You need to find out um, about therapists before you go to see them. You need to find out if they specialize in a particular approach, uh, if they're eclectic, um, and again, making sure they're licensed. So I do have uh, a list of private practice licensed therapists that I highly recommend. If any of you are looking for a therapist, um, feel free to email me and I will give you some references, not just for yourself, but maybe for family members. Remember, insurance probably doesn't cover 100%.
of the cost of therapy. And uh, I just want to say, if you really look at the value of therapy, and it's extremely valuable, um, you know, look at the priorities. You know, we're spending a lot of money getting our nails done, but we balk at spending money at therapy, you know, for therapy. Think about that. Um, you know, I'm just saying, get your priorities straight. Um, to me, a good therapist is a lot like having an, ex an incredible back massage experience because sometimes your back gets all knotted up, the muscles are all knotted up, and you try to rub your own shoulders and neck, you know, but you can't really reach those knots deep, deep down that are causing you so much pain. You can't reach those by yourself. And that's my analogy for a good therapist. Um, they can help you reach those deep, parts of you that are knotted up and hurting and uh, if you're keeping secrets secrets are terribly destructive to oneself and um, if you're carrying secret shame or um, uh, something that happened that you've never told anyone that kind of thing uh, I highly recommend that you seek out therapy and I want to mention Family Services of Tulare County Family Services of Tulare County is an incredible nonprofit organization that offers counseling, often free, up to six sessions for almost any psychological problem. But they have some really uh, specialized programs, such as domestic violence assist, you know, assistance with domestic violence situations, uh, sexual assault. There's a whole program on uh, sexual assault, you know. Uh, services and um, parenting issues um, just I mean it's an incredible uh, organization so why don't you just uh, Google Family Services of Tulare County find their web page um, they're on Facebook as well you can get some good counseling through them at a low cost as well the therapies um, that you're going to receive require you to really want to work at getting better. You can't be passive in therapy. You really can't. You, you can't hold back. You've got to let everything out. You've got to get everything out in the open. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to have a good therapeutic, you know, you can't blame the therapist, you know, if you didn't really give it your all in therapy. You've got to try to be honest with yourself and honest with the therapist. And, off, you know, that's not easy. Being honest with ourselves is one of the hardest things that we need to do in our lives. So um, whether it's behavioral therapy or cognitive therapy or a combination, cognitive behavioral therapy um, or uh, psychodynamic therapy based on Freudian principles, you know, I could, I could tell my dreams every day to someone and, and, uh, and think about uh, symbolic meaning in, in the dreams. What am I trying to tell myself in my dreams? I think that would be awesome to have the luxury to be able to do that. Um, but most insurance will over cover, only cover short-term therapies. So, you know, nobody's going to have years of Freudian psychoanalytic therapy nowadays unless they're incredibly wealthy and can afford that ongoing uh, relationship with the therapist. But no matter how short your therapy is, it requires what we call a therapeutic alliance. And that means that the relationship between the client and the therapist is really, really important. And you've got to um, work together. And the therapist is there to give you support and guidance and help you see things that maybe you haven't been able to see before, understand things you haven't been able to understand before. But the therapist can't do it all. So the therape therapeutic alliance is a commitment between you and the therapist. You're going to commit to therapy you're going to be at every session. You're going to be there on time. You're going to open up. You're going to, you're going to dig deep. And your therapist is going to be there for you. If you're willing to do that, then you can expect the best outcomes, no matter what the therapeutic approach. If someone needs medication, 
your a licensed therapist will refer you to a psychiatrist who can prescribe psycho you know psychotropic medications they are extremely effective in a lot of cases and in others not and unfortunately there's kind of a uh, wait and see approach you know because not there isn't one drug that works this you know perfectly for everyone and I might do really well on one type of antidepressant medication but somebody else might not do as well on that uh, medication because our metabolisms are different um, just our ages could cause a big difference in the way the drug is uh, working in our bodies and our brains but I but I encourage people to think about this if if your depression or anxiety, those are the most common problems, are severe enough that you need medication, you also need to be in therapy. It isn't enough to take medication. You have to work on your thinking, cognitive, and behavioral patterns and what needs to change. The medication can help your brain kind of get back to a place where it's working more properly and you can think more clearly. But if you don't change your habits of, say, pessimistic thinking um, or biases that you're carrying around, uh, resentment and anger over things from the past, you know, you can override the medication and think and feel yourself right back into a depression. So you really need... If you're going to be on medication, my feeling is you absolutely need to be in therapy, a talking therapy, at the same time. So I encourage you all to get help. Sometimes what you need is that really, really good back massage that gets at the deep knotted muscles. And to me, that's what good therapy is. Everybody needs it at some point in, the, in their life. Everyone. There's no stigma attached to it. We have free counseling for COS students, and that includes online students. There's a counseling center here at COS, and you simply call the COS Health Center and make an appointment. There's a little paperwork you have to do, but it's well worth it. Uh, it's free because you're a student here at COS, and if you had to pay for it in the private sector, it would be about $150 an hour. So that's quite a bargain, and I encourage you to take uh, take control of your life and, and take steps to improve. If you're, if you're having relationship issues in your, um, in your adult romantic life, for instance, uh, dysfunctional relationships in your family, um, if you're having a, a substance abuse issues, um, if you suffer from extreme anxiety or depression, please, there's no stigma in asking for help. It's a sign of strength. And it's a sign that you're probably going to do really well in therapy because you're willing to ask for help when you need it. And isn't that what you want to role model for your children as well? So I hope you enjoy Chapter 15, learning about all these therapies. It's a long chapter, but it has to be because there are so many different approaches. Okay, stay well. After Chapter 15, things are going to ease up for you in this online class because we're heading into the last couple of weeks. And I'm not going to heap a bunch of work on you um, after chapter 15. It'll be pretty straightforward uh, in the last two chapters, not nothing extra. Okay? So I'll talk to you again after we're done with chapter 15. Stay well. Work hard. I know you've been working really hard. Hang in there. We're almost there. Okay. Bye-bye.